Hello again, everyone. It's Labraquita Marketing again. Um, Samantha Tong here with another one of my expert interviews. Uh, so today I'm talking to Will Gregg, and we're going to be talking about the credibility of marketing. Uh, so, Will, can you uh, give us a bit of an introduction of who you are? Yes, um, thank you very much for having me, first of all. Um, credibility in marketing, you have big subject um, and quite topical, I think, at the moment, especially when you think about sort of recession and uncertainty. And people, of course, will be asking, what is the point of marketing, probably? And talking about probably marketing carts and things. But yes, going back to my my history i spent uh, 10 11 years um in a large business to business industrial organization uh, spent quite a lot of time in marketing departments there um realizing that uh, how um, low down the priority list marketing was thought of in those days even though that the department in those days had some really good visionary quite visionary marketers there um, people that were really keen on it but uh, and would they achieved an awful lot actually while they were there and while I was there I learned a huge amount from them too which was great um, and during my time uh, at uh, the large industrial business I did I went back to do a, uh, a master's uh, a business studies master's which is great um, but realized that the that the marketing function wasn't particularly well taught I have to say then moved away from big corporate into entrepreneurship uh, and got stuck into food and beverage for a while which is great uh, and, and fell into the trap also there uh, as a founder of becoming absolutely convinced that my ideas were absolutely the way without really doing things like diagnosis, without doing things like testing, talking to customers to find out whether what we were doing was actually what they wanted. Uh, and then also once we got established, going back to the customer and keeping asking them. Um, to adapt so that was certainly a good a good learning curve uh we we uh, i was in food and beverage for about um oh i think best part of 10 years uh sold out and then spent uh, i've been spending quite a lot of time helping businesses with growth and development and certainly small businesses with with growth and development and what we do is we start and we look at strategy first. It's one of the first things we do. And of course, the, the first thing we do with strategy is to find out what's going on with yep. the company, with the product, with the customers, with the competitors. So we do lots of diagnosis. And that doesn't just start with external stuff too. We look internally as well. Yep. And then we put in place it, we put in place strategies um, to improve, um, to tighten up so that we can set proper objectives um, and we can position properly and then look at um, uh, if there is a marketing budget to then um, set about the, the great task of, of um, tactics uh, and implementing and achieving those things. So, you know, what we, what we try and do at that stage is really split um, the, the stages are being very thorough with diagnosis. Then we move on to strategy before we even think about, you know, tactical execution. So, and, uh, and th that, that, that'll sound very familiar because yes, I, d I was on the mini MBA in marketing and brand management with Mark Ritz and did those during lockdown because I thought it was probably a good idea to go back to some education and had my eyes opened, you know, having been through various stages of business development and, and um, business studies teaching, marketing was taught poorly until... Uh, I got onto that course and have been fascinated with that process and how it can change the performance of brands. Uh, it's yeah. really powerful stuff, definitely. It really is. It really is. And I totally agree with starting with strategy. Don't so many people, I think it's, it sort of leads on to what, what we're talking about to a certain extent because yeah. a lot of people out there that call themselves marketers, I think both client side and people like us that are, yeah. that are consultants. Um who jump straight to tactics um because they're not marketers that it's not a protect it's not a protected um status anyone can call themselves a marketer sure um 
And I guess what the first thing we need to discuss, how do, how do people out there who um, who know they need help with marketing, whether whether it's a marketing department that just needs a bit of an outside view for help or if it's or if it's, you know, a, a business owner who knows that they need need that 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 help. How do they go and go about finding someone with the right qualifications experience? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a very good question. And I think it's tough because there are so many, so many people out there and there'll be lots of people that are very good at what they do, of course. But there are loads of people out there um, all looking to, to work with small businesses and help with these uh, the, the, these issues of, you know, really becoming good marketing organisations. So, you know, it's, it's very difficult to find, isn't it? Um, so I think but I, I guess. What, what what businesses should be doing is first of all of course you know the the, the big question is will do they recognize that they need this stuff and it's very difficult it depends on what yeah. stage they're at and of course that's that's the first thing isn't it because when you are a founder of a business or you are running a business um the the one of the things you look at you know so often the things you look at first is are we controlling cost and oh mm. actually actually i think oh there's a there's a cost there that i think we could probably do without so let's cut it oh i, I oh, oh haven't i done a good job but what that's yes. actually doing is stifling the business in my view it's stifling it it's stifling innovation it's stifling creativity it's making things tougher for your people which is also potentially a difficulty whereas i think what you should be looking at is um thinking about strategy mm. and of course by that we really do mean um you know your marketing your brand what have you got um and and i think what, once you've made the realization that you could do with a bit of support on this and it could just start with having a discussion with someone to, to talk about their approach and then and then letting them loose effectively and getting them involved but i think it's to go to your warm network you know i, re I really do think it is that you, you, your organizations will have a great network and it's lifting the phone or sending out a few em emails to say who who is there in your network that you know that that gets this stuff and then of course you check them out on linkedin and see and see what they have and see and of course you know you you will have a, C a cmo job title perhaps or a head of marketing or senior marketing executive keep scrolling down on that linkedin in their education to see if they have a formal qualification in marketing and if they do then I think there's a fair chance that, it, that that person is absolutely worth talking to because then it comes down to chemistry, doesn't it? And I think chemistry yeah. is also a very important part right. of that. So, yes, I think initially, without wanting to go through very expensive searches, uh, there are other ways too. But, the, you know, initially it's going to your warm network. And then apart from that, there are there are great networking organizations that within their network they can recommend good people and that there are there are organizations that do this very well um there's a, an organization called the portfolio collective who have this who, who and this is basically a network group that has um a, a really nice community of as they call them portfolio professionals and there will be lots of marketing consultants within that that will have some great experience and going to those people and tapping into that network and other networks with you know is a great way to do it i think i think you, you can certainly find a good person with some you know initial searching without without really spending very much money at all um, to find someone i guess then it's asking the right questions isn't it yeah yes. like if you ask um what's your approach what would you do uh, to help me if they say right I'm going to do these Facebook posts I'm going to do if they launch straight into that dear clear <laughs> <laughs> yes quite yes they, what you will want to see the business before they even start to talk absolutely. about tactics that's a good start yeah yeah absolutely because otherwise what happens with marketing and marketing departments it gets sort of siloed away into a little broom cupboard where someone says oh do you know what I think it's time we send out a newsletter. I worked yes. with a client uh, and I had it was a it was a really it, I really enjoyed the placement. They had the, they had a fantastic team 
um, at, at this business. Um, and one of the first things that I, that I arrived to when I when we, we I got to the business was uh, in the office there was a great big stack of postcards um, in envelopes ready to be sent out. And having asked what these were, I, I was told, oh, this was a direct mail out that we're meant to be sending. I have no idea why it's going out. And so therefore that's why I'm not quite sure why we're sending it. And this yeah. was an idea of one of the board of directors that said, oh, don't you think we ought to send out postcards to our customers? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy was going, I don't really know why we're sending this stuff. And of course, he was absolutely right, because it's the why. You've got to, why, what was yeah. this doing? What what problem was it solving? What objective was it trying to hit? And of course, to get those answers, you need to do the diagnosis and the strategy beforehand. Yes. You know, and this is a classic ass about face, I'm afraid. Yes. And and therefore, I'm afraid a complete waste of money. Um, so, um, you know, that, that's a classic situation that I see that, that I'm sure businesses are seeing time and time again and it is amazing isn't it um, yes I had but, a very similar situation I won't say which company mm. we had a pile and we weren't expecting it Martin's department weren't expecting it at all a huge pile of brochures aimed mm. at education which was not one of our identified target markets yes and it was full of spelling errors as well, just, just to oh make God. it worse. <laughs> and we were like, where's this come from? And it had come from a, a senior director who'd done it on a whim. And we were then told it was coming out of our budget. Yeah, it's sort of <laughs> not unusual, is it? It's not unusual, you know, and and the, and the thing is, often marketing is 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 too often seen um, as something that that you know has carries very little weight uh, and importance really yes. and that anyone can really do um, and i think that's the crux of the matter and it, mm. it comes back to this credibility of marketing because it doesn't have the, that credibility it should partly because there are all these people out there who call themselves marketers who yes are not. um because of that there's this attitude amongst in businesses that well, it's not a skill. Anyone could do marketing. I can do marketing. I'll do. I just want to do this thing on a whim without thinking it through. Yeah, because that's just important, especially if they've, if they've got a marketing department. And I think I don't know if you find this, but in 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 particularly my sector, they tend to client side. But maybe it's because of their budget. To be fair, um, often employ junior people. And then don't invest in their education. So um, they need that external help really yeah. to make sure it's strategy first. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I had the classic situation of this large B2B organization. This was a multinational organization. Um, it was they were very impressive, I have to say. They were brilliant manufacturers, you know, they were um, you know they had some fantastic operators um, and sort of almost scientists in their field. They were big paper makers. Um, and what they'd achieved, um, a, a lot of it in the UK, was, was very impressive in terms of, you know, manufacturing capability. But one of the things they fell short of was putting really any emphasis on marketing. And what, what, and what marketing, what, did it, what, what the department had come, had become, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, um, a, a sort of a department that was put in the same sort of, um, on the same pedestal as something like, um, um, you know, financial control or operations. Um, but it was thought of as a support function only, right? Yeah. Classic situation. And we, we would sit there providing information for executives to go to meetings and guffaw, <laughs> basically. So import data, um, some competitive activity, perhaps. And then there will be capital projects that we would we would provide and write reports and do scenario plans for and then when it came to because the guy that was running it at the time he was because he was he was so passionate about marketing which is brilliant 
he he then took it upon himself to write some strategic documents for the business um, that were then censored. You know, so I mean, it, it was a it was a classic situation in a B two B organization of using marketing as a support function, and therefore you're right. Why why would people invest in skills? You know, uh, I remember the, there were a load of very very highly paid consultants running around the organization at the time, and I always remember um, being on the phone to one of them and him describing the department as the department for lost souls. There you are. <laughs> it sums it up, doesn't it? I mean, it's just brilliant, you know, and that and that's, you know, that's the sort of writing on the wall, you know, in terms of, of uh, you know, the, the sort of future of the business in terms of margins and brand and everything. So, yeah, really interesting stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, not I'm not in the least bit surprised. Um, but but also we should, you know, lay some of the blame um in the on the on the lapse of marketing itself mm. because you're right um you know pe people are you know getting very big jobs in marketing without any qualification at all so i understand you know and organizations therefore and because marketers and marketing departments are very quick to sort of you know become you know this this support office doing tactical things only without any strategy or planning you know it actually therefore means that the marketing department isn't really being that effective so therefore it's a sort of i'm afraid it's 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 the vicious circle isn't it yeah. you know you have a marketing department that's not really doing a great job um because you you, you have the people in there that even if they have the skills don't have you know aren't able to voice it at board level to get yeah. the proper budgets they need yeah. to support the objectives you know and, and, and aren't, aren't able to aren't in a position to do what they want to so yeah i've seen it in multiple times you've got some great i think this is an interesting stat which i think is related i don't still the case but last time i looked at it it was something like it was around 70 percent of marketers are women for whatever reason 70 percent of marketing directors are men and i've seen it time and time again that the, the marketing director who's the newly positioned marketing director this is his background blah blah he's been great he's used to be head of sales or he was the best salesman it's and it's not the same thing sales think about and it's it's quite right because that's discipline they 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 think more about the short term over the long term we as marketers need to think about both <laughs> absolutely and, uh, absolutely and they don't know i don't understand strategy and again they come in thinking it's easy Anyone yeah and it, you know and it, yeah i think i think that's right and you're and you, you know when you talk about sales department yes of course and, and the sales department is 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 a function of marketing i i had yes. another dis very interesting discussion with some guy who was head of marketing for this big organization and i said okay so um you know that, just I, I was was I was wanting to ask a slightly controversial question. I'm saying, well, so what's the relationship do you have with the sales team? Oh, they're in a different department. And I'm going, no, they're not. <laughs> they are very yes. much a function of marketing because you have a sales team to operate at the bottom of a sales of, of the of the sales funnel, don't you? And and what's come before that is is um you know a, the, the the joint and of course with the sales team marketing effort to get to the point where there's been lots of uh, awareness building you know moving customers you know from consideration to you know the, towards the bottom of the funnel where you've got the sales team who are nudging and closing sales which is what they do isn't it you know so and the marketing department are, are there to support everything those those guys do knowledge material yeah. um you know if it's b2b giving these guys the time to develop relationships etc etc so Find out you know what it, they know as well uh, absolutely and, and tapping these guys and these are the best guys you know to come back with this you know lovely um qualitative information that that the marketing will then need to to go back to track how their brand is doing and of course yes. brand tracking brand management brand planning is so important wherever you go um you know and i would argue particularly in 
organizations uh, that are that are b2b you know and of course that's so often shoved aside um because i think the importance of the sales team here just talking about the sales team and how important those guys are it's it's th those those guys are sort of uncovering things that, that you would never know people think about your brand and so therefore and and, and it's the inf it's gathering of that information that allows marketing teams and this includes the sales team and in fact it includes everyone within an organization let's face it everyone is doing marketing within an organization every day of their life or they should be you know but but it, it what what that then gives is the the um the the chances of people finding or, or thinking about an angle for a product or a service that they hadn't thought about before. You know, and this goes back to the arguments that the great Rory Sutherland comes out with, and that is, you know, the it's the psychology and human behavior means that marketing is not necessarily a science. In fact, he would say it's not a science because it is so you, you it, this is, we're talking psychology and human behavior, which you cannot say anything is right or wrong. And of course that's what's so important. And in order to sort of harvest that, you need this constant flow of information, don't you? So that means everyone, has got to be involved in this and everyone's got to be part of marketing it's not a yeah. siloed department is it, it you know it shouldn't be it, well no quite you know and <laughs> and when when organizations realize this it is that it's it's at that point that they can really see, you see the power of things like brand you yes. know uh, and and then when you of course um, i'm sure i'm going off on a real tangent here but, but when you start to talk about brand You've then got this wonderful thing called differentiation, um, and of course, mm -hmm. that's that's and a, a differentiation is a, is a bit of a uh, it, it's it's a bit controversial at the moment because there are lots of people saying differentiation is nonsense. But at a brand level, I I I, I think there is differentiation, mm. you know, and and when you have differentiation at brand level, so the value of a brand increases you know um so uh, and this happens in this can happen in any context in my view um and, and this is why it's so important uh, i think i think it's quite we can demonstrate quite easily that that's nonsense um why does apple do so well if there's no differentiation yeah they don't yeah. do they there are other people that do exactly the same products as them one thing i like to to, to bring up is Microsoft came out with a tablet a good 10, 15 years before Apple did, but it it flopped. Mm. Why? Apple's better at brand. Yeah, a brand <laughs> and, and their and positioning brand, and, yeah. and and I think I think I think another thing to help people understand how uh, marketing should be a, a silo and should be integral to everything is what brand actually is. I think people misunderstand what brand is. I think oh, it's the colours, it's the font and i probably brought this up in loads of videos but <laughs> yes really yeah important point. absolutely the brand your brand is the core of what you are as a business and what you represent to customers absolutely bezos said it's what people say about you when you're not in the room isn't yeah. it you know that, uh, which is which is great you know if if, if there's anyone that does market I don't, i'm not quite sure there's anyone that does marketing better you know in, in terms of when you think of the whole and what and what bezos says about brand is spot on isn't it it is it is um and you need to be able to articulate what the brand is and everyone in the business needs to be able to do that as well, even if it's not the exact words of your brand proposition, as long as it's along those lines. And they understand where they fit in that. In yeah. it. Uh, and there's been plenty of research on this that shows that um, organisations that are genuinely brand focused um, have profit margins double, double the profit margins of those in the same industry. So it's a no-brainer. Yeah, and, and of course, and all the other lovely things that go with it. And of course, profit's very important because that's why businesses are, you know, so, are so often in business, you know, because yeah. ultimately <laughs> they've got to make a profit, you know, which is important. But all the other wonderful things that go with a strong brand, and that is, you know, um, 
teams within the organization feel that they belong um yes. they, they they feel that this is that this that, that there is a purpose and of course purpose is a dangerous one because there's a lot of you know um nonsense spoken about purpose and brands positioning on purpose but it's nonsense um but you know, because they don't believe it you know and they just think they yeah. need to tick a box but i think where purpose can work really well and, and simon sinek talks a lot about this isn't it is, is internally and and making sure that teams are aligned um because there is this sort of wider purpose rather than just going to work yeah. you know that is very motivating and and a brand can really help that and of course what the, what that means is that you know, you've got more motivated people you've always got people that want to work there um so you've got the choice you've got the pick of you know a, a very a very considerable talent pool you know and apple's a classic situation i mean we always use apple but even even smaller brands are very good Absolutely. at this uh, it was interesting um because of my, my background is restaurants um and spent a bit of time in restaurants um there is a there is a massive issue as we all know because of this lovely brexit thing um but but um don't want to get political on your uh, <laughs> on your interviews but anyway it's a real challenge for restaurants at the moment in london and probably everywhere actually and that is to recruit and retain good good people mm. um and Absolutely. so a lot of a lot, a lot of restaurants are really struggling with that and so many other things but um when you look at the really established brands that that genuinely care for their people and that is part of 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 what their brand is all about i was talking to a guy really really impressive guy that works that that, that is um a chairman of a of a business called brasserie barco and they're very successful organizations of pubs and sort of brasseries um that that is that has a very clear position in the market and it's very good at communicating that and as a result, what they need to produce is consistently good food, um, give great service in pubs and in restaurants. And as a result, what they do is they, they place an awful lot of emphasis. They invest an awful lot of money in their people, genuinely mm -hmm. in their people at every single level. And this is a, this is a the, the classic case of a business doing marketing properly it becoming a brand becoming part of the fabric of the business yes. and so are they looking for people i mean no they're not they have fantastic people within the business and they retain them um and as a result they do extremely well so you know so so often with restaurants again it's very short term thinking when it comes to marketing and brand strategy but the ones that get it get it right goodness me do they do they reap the rewards another example the river cafe i don't know if you've ever if, if heard or had the pleasure of going I, to the river cafe my grandmother used to live in axminster so yeah you know it's 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 a, a, an amazing place that um has an incredible brand because it's been going for so long and it delivers constantly on its brand um and it is amazing and there are two stories here sorry again stop me if i'm really rabbiting on but there are two stories here a they constantly have um a pool of amazing chefs and people wanting to work there because they have this fantastic ethos in the kitchen of learning and support on not overworking their people on you know constantly learning about new twists on italian cuisine the best cuisine in the world in my view but not only that when you look at their me their menu it's eye-wateringly expensive <laughs> unfortunately but it's eye-watering expensive because they've been very successful in delivering to their target market who happily pay that because they know they're going to get an amazing experience every time. This is good marketing and yes. good brand management, you know, and it works for the product. It works for how they price it. And it, and it also works internally supporting their people, having this fantastic ethos, which of course translates into an amazing customer experience. Yeah. It's so it's, it's, 
Another good you know. case study. <laughs> yeah, the, do you know what? I could reel off so many of them. They're so impressive. I think I was thinking of the wrong one. I was thinking of Hugh Fernie Whittingstalls. Oh, uh, yeah, the River Cottage, that was. Cottage, um, right. So the yeah. River Cafe... <laughs> The, the River Cafe, well, yeah, the one is not quite next Minster. It's it just, it's near Hammersmith Bridge, actually, as it goes. Yeah. But uh, if you ever get a chance to visit, absolutely do it. You might need to save up for a while, though. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but but, but, like but let me tell you, it is so worth it. Um, yeah. And then the other course, the other there was been there was a, a Twitter storm against poor old Tom Kerridge because he was charging ninety quid or something for a steak and chips, and everyone was going, "That's ridiculous." And he was going, "Well, actually." Uh, you know what I want to do is pay my people properly, yes. buy really good, well-sourced meat that I know has good heritage, and because of because you, I, of what are the what I do in the service I offer, I'm targeting that at people that are gladly pay it, exactly. and I'm busy, and in fact I'm fully booked. So for me, that's good. Exactly. Marketing. If if he was struggling to fill tables, that would be one thing, but he's not. It's a bit like um, people can keep complaining Disneyland um, or Disney World, I can't remember which is which now. Anyway, the, the big one in Florida, they keep putting their prices up, but they're always overbooked. They're always turning people away. Well, wow. well of course they keep putting their prices up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it comes down to supply and demand. I mean, you yeah. know, the, the, there is always the, the, the question of you know, again, making sure you're talking to customers, listening to customers yes. at that point. But, you know, because ultimately, you know, what is loyalty? Mm, I mean, Byron Sharp says there's no, no such thing as loyalty. But I suppose what you will want is if people are paying, you know, inf what they feel are inflated prices, but want the experience of, of Disneyland and then come away with saying, well, it's actually not not great value for money and i feel i was ripped off i think i think that's one thing that they part of the reason they're fully booked is pe the same people go multiple times a year interesting and if, if that's happening then they know they're getting the experience right i think i think disney from what i understand it's not my thing but they understand well, the target yeah. market which yeah. isn't me <laughs> yeah and they understand um how to make that experience and yes I, and i think this is one thing that that's missed as well i think a lot of people think marketing is at the beginning then there's sales then there's delivery marketing should be across the board because not just not just in terms of we've spoken a bit about um uh keeping your employees engaged and on board and excited and retaining them um through multiple multiple ways um but but being excited about the brand it's, it's the same as the case for customers because you want i mean um look at if you think about the customer journey mark marketing and marketing communications which i think a lot of people think of as marketing it's mm. yeah. important yeah even it's, just it's thinking about marketing tactics. communications you need to think about after the sale as well because you want them to come back even if it's a sort of big sort of purchase that isn't going to be a repeat purchase you want them to tell everyone else about you <laughs> absolutely and of course that comes right at the bottom of the funnel and it's one of the things that you should be probably setting objectives on yes. you know you want advocacy don't you um uh, and you know the great measure of advocacy is is you know um uh and it's actually just gone just completely out of my head um the net promoter score yes. um yeah. you know and it's just sending out that fantastic one question Question that is you know you know to what extent would you recommend our service between mm. one and ten grade it you know one of the most powerful questions you can ask and it is amazing that so many businesses don't ask that stuff you know because yeah. that's your advocacy and what we what we found um just as a little case study with the business that i work with that were were doing this very effective direct mail that wasn't <laughs> but they we, we we i ended up working with them for about four years fantastic team of people um that all got it in the end and together we sort of created this 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 marketing plan and this position in the market which was which is you know fantastic and and that everyone absolutely aligned um behind it which is which is great and one of the things that came out of it was um that that customers you know were were and clients were loved the fact that if you could deliver equipment to them ecologically 
in other words, on a cargo bike, that was going to be something that that really helped with with um, sort of distinctiveness. So that that yeah. gave gave the brand some distinctiveness. And one of the other things that we discovered because we used a lot, a lot of freelancers to support the service, and one of the things we knew that advocacy and recommendation was a big part of of the service. And we decided that these freelancers should be treated as if they were customers. And these guys were always um, paid early, the freelancers, which is unusual, um, yeah. that they had equipment that was extremely well serviced, vans, which were, they, they deliver the equipment to, were clean and tidy, um, and they became part of our community. So it meant that these guys became salesmen for us on set. And that was hugely powerful. Um, but in order to deliver that, everyone had to align behind the promises that, that we were giving as a brand. And that became very powerful, I have to say. Yes. Yes, and I think I think um, I guess that's another question you need to um, ask if you're you're talking to marketers uh, want to hire someone. Do they understand what distinctiveness is? Do they understand mm. what brand is? Do they understand what? Do they understand about tar you know targeting um, salience? Of course, is another one. You know, market and how you yeah. Yeah, how yeah. you need to understand that market and speak their language yeah absolutely and and you know and having spent of course this stuff takes time this is all part of the diagnosis isn't it yes, and, and the business that i work with and uh, i mean i spent four years with them i was meant to be there six months but in the end it was four years because you know luckily the management team um they 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 saw that there was you know we we managed to discover that this great um potential of this for this company and the brand and so what we did was spent a good six months diagnosing which then meant that we we understood the market and the targets that we wanted to go for and uh, so we knew what and how to position ourselves because we knew a lot of the pain points that these customers and what and some of the and a lot of the needs that they needed and you know you align those to the skills and the expertise within the organization and yeah. you compare it to what the competitors are offering yes. position on that and often against a competitor which can be a very powerful way of positioning um and these guys you know because of that very clear positioning you know it meant that that you know we we absolutely were seen you know to be doing certain jobs very well and people would come to us so they would they would you know um they would have a photographic shoot that would come in these guys were lighting experts in the photographic um and sort of uh, content production world and so a producer would be, get the brief and go oh my god this looks complicated immediately they think this company and say so, because it was on their mind you know it what at the point of a point of purchase you know it that we were we became top of mind that salience and that's so important mm -hmm. and with that you know coming back to what you're saying about brand it's not about logos and colors and stuff well it can be because it's very important to have your codes correct isn't yeah. it so, so yeah it's just to be clear i wasn't saying none of that no 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 of course i know i know you weren't but not the but, definition of brand but no Absolutely. Yes, all that feed, it, it feed, that's how you represent your brand or Absolutely. how you represent your brand. And it's so important. You mentioned distinctiveness. Distinctiveness is so important. So, so important. There's a reason all these big, huge multinational BC companies that are successful do that because they need you need to stand out. You need to be remembered and you need to be top of mind, which is something you mentioned. And you yep. need to be. You need to stand out against the competition and distinction. That's one of the ways you do that is. Yeah, absolutely. And staying top of mind. And of course, when it comes to codes and logos and things like that, that's also very important. And you, you throw it on everything. You do absolutely everything with it in terms of yeah. codifying stuff so that it stays top of mind. You know, and, and in the sort of narrow B2B segment that we were in, you know, there was certainly there was certainly. Um, uh, an opportunity for us to do that because you know there were quite a lot of bland logos out there and these guys were were a lovely sort of bright orange color <laughs> and as soon as you saw one of the vans with the bright orange color that would arrive on set everyone would go oh great 
We've got these guys here. We know mm. we're sorted. Fantastic. You know, so you slap it on everything, you know. And, of course, the great brands that do all these things well, they do, they slap it, slap it on everywhere at every possible opportunity because this all helps with, you know, mental memory. As, as Byron Sharp would call it, sorry, to, you know, these guys are the sort of academic, the marketing academics. He calls it mental availability, which, of course, is yeah. really, really important isn't it in brands yeah. you know and of course for consumer products when you when you combine that with physical availability you know it's great and i always use that fantastic when you're talking when, on the subject of things like salience is whenever you're you know you you're on holiday somewhere you could be in somewhere quite obscure it's hot you sit down for lunch and the first thing you ask for is can i have a coke please you've not even seen a menu um you know you've not even you're not even really thought very much about what's going on but what you know is you're hot and you're thirsty and you want something sweet uh, and so that's what you say i'll have a coke and sure enough a coke appears so there's mental and physical availability and that's the power of that i mean that doesn't always work of course with b2b brands but it could you know, and there is the possibility of doing that within the slightly narrow sphere of, of, of a B2B market. Um, so, yeah, very powerful. And, of course, the difference between distinctiveness and differentiation as well is, is, a, is a, you know, sometimes I find myself losing people at that point. But it's an interesting discussion <laughs> nonetheless. Well, one thing I think you've touched on um, there briefly is, is a lot of marketers don't really understand it. Well, in B2C, I think most of them understand. In B2B, I think a lot of marketers don't understand, or at least their bosses don't understand, don't like it, is the part that emotion plays. Like if you're talk if you're talking to a marketer and they don't think that, that they're all about the facts, throwing the facts at the, the customers, they're not the person for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how technical the person you're speaking to is. Emotion plays a part. Even if it's just, I know these guys know what they're doing and I'm relieved they're here. Like you say, it's the, that orange van p turning up sparked an emotion in them because that because the groundwork had been done, both in the product and the service and everything Absolutely. else. Absolutely. 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 And it's so important. It's also important in B2B because, again, you know, when you look at what the great Rory Sutherland talks about on the psychology of buying in a B2B environment, you know, it is very different that, you know, buyers in a B2B environment are under an awful lot of pressure because, mm. you know, they're under pressure to make sure that whatever they buy is correct yes. um, because it has huge implications potentially on an organization if you get it wrong. And also for the individual, mind. well, they're quite, yeah, for the individual that's cocked it up, they could lose their job. So that whole process of buying in a B2B environment is very important. And that, yes, does involve emotion. Um, and, but it also what, what these guys have got to be convinced is that whoever's providing the service or the product has got their back, you know, yes. and, and that they are going to deliver and yes when you talk about emotion what you're talking about of course is the brand building side of things and it applies to, to b2b as well as b2c in my view mm -hmm. you know and, and i've seen big or small organization i worked in a small b2b company where emotion was a big part of it because we positioned on knowledge we've got your back and the fact that we're nice people to work with these these very these three very simple positioning statements actually really resonated with 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 customers uh, and this is very b2b and quite specialized you know but i think it's i think it's it's really important for for brands in both um consumer and business buying that emotion does play a part of this um and of course because it is all about building brand, because the the, the long term, and it, I'm afraid it is long term investment that you make in a brand over a period of time does mm -hmm. build, you know, and, uh, you know, um, salience, uh, um, values, and it also helps to build and um, help to develop your top of funnel awareness too, you know, and that's definitely one of the things we discovered by um giving some emotion to the brand and that that was ah oh, they're here 
it's okay they have our backs you know that got out there you know that that got people talking and so that helped to expand awareness for us and brought new people into the market. Um, you know, we, we targeted a very specific se segment. In London, there are loads of fantastic creative content agencies, quite small, doing some amazing work. So these guys were fantastic, creatively, brilliant, um, you know, uh, photographers, uh, c cinematographers, but doing sort of short form, uh, but not necessarily that good with lighting. So what they needed some support with that, the logistics of lighting. How do you light something? If you're trying to film something in a forest, they'll be going, my God, you know, if we've got big lights, how do we power those? Come and see these guys, they'll sort it for you. And, and that was a huge weight off a producer's mind that they had that. Um, and, and of course that became a big part of the brand. And of course those, the, those feelings are, emotion, are emotional, but that takes time. And the problem is uh, what, what marketers get seduced into is that anything we spend, whether it's time or money or both, on developing a brand, we want to return on it. Well, if you're doing the emotional brand building stuff, your return won't be immediate. So exactly. often what happens is that gets cut. So you, what, what you have to do is be bold enough to realize that brand building will take time and you won't necessarily see a specific return on it. But, but if you then combine that with your short-term engaging with your sales team, to convert those sales, then obviously, if you do both of those things, um, then you know you, you become so much more of an effective marketer. Um, yes. You know, and of course, as in in this. Sorry, I'm really rabbiting on. But in the digital world, where it is all about ROI and performance marketing, people will find that they will come unstuck eventually because the cost of acquisition will go up if they're only concentrating on activation marketing. So and that's yeah. another thing that's that they need to look at. Yes. I mean, there's, again, um, again, there's been quite a lot of research on this. Uh, yes. You, you need to think about the short term. I think we've, we have touched on this a little bit. You need to yeah. touch on the short term and the long term. If you're talking to a marketer to come in and help you and they guarantee, oh, I guarantee a certain number of leads in six months and they don't talk about anything else. First yes. thing, can guarantee leads or certainly not good quality leads. Yeah. Um, you can make them more likely and you can have certain targets that you're working yes. towards, but you need to make sure that you have the long term term objectives as well as the short-term objectives in in b2b your resources should be 50 50 percent split that seems to be the best from research in yeah terms of yeah, yeah it depends on the segment but it's roughly that isn't it i it's mean the consumers that, it might be 60 40 on the brand in, building yeah, depending, on, depending on where your budgets are huge. yeah yeah, in B2C, even more skewed towards the long-term brand building. Yeah, yeah absolutely, because that's where the money goes. And if Because they, if yeah. they're doing TV, which, of course, TV isn't dead, contrary okay. to the belief of lots of people, but if they're putting it in TV, then there's obviously going to be big budgets involved. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, but you can still do that. If you don't have the budget of... I know, absolutely. Cadbury, absolutely. You should still be thinking about long-term brand building. How do you get that agree. target audience get in front of that target audience get remembered by that target audience for what you are and what you you know what your brand core brand actually is absolutely and i mean there's always a dilemma with really small businesses with 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 businesses that are starting out it is all about activation isn't it because uh, they've got yeah. to create some revenue so that's really important but you must keep in mind managing a brand which will be very young of course but you know i think you know aligning the values and aligning the sort of thoughts of the management team into understanding that your brand could become your most valuable asset and managing it from day one is going mm -hmm. to be very important and of course as we all know that that um you know if you're if you're delivering short term in other words converting sales and that then that can help you drive your your long term because you can invest in it can't you so um you know that but so yeah it, it all depends where you are and of course when you're starting out it's all about sales but yes keeping brand in mind is very important yes absolutely absolutely and um 
Yeah, so, do, do you think there's anything the likes of you and I should do other than videos like this to kind of promote the credibility of marketing, how important it is and um, important it is that people actually know what they're talking about? Yeah, I, look, I think I, I, I think it's I think it's tough, isn't it? Because we all know businesses are under the cosh, aren't they? And when you look at what's going on economically, economic forecasts, yeah. you know, aren't looking great, are they? So, you know, people, you know, businesses want to survive. I've had discussions with um, companies that are doing great things, but they say, look, I'm sorry. You know, we would love more external support and we love the fact that someone's coming in with with some independent thoughts and being quite creative and a little bit out there on things. But, but you know, what what they're thinking about is survival, um, you know, which and, I, and you can completely understand that. So I think what what I think we can keep doing is talking like this doing because this is this is great brand building for you isn't it you know yeah, you're sure. you're talking some great stuff um you talk you talk to some yeah yeah well yes absolutely completely you know you talk you talk to some really interesting people about these things i think this doing this is very important but i think you know what what, what we've got to keep doing is talking to potential clients and keep doing the research. What are people saying about marketing? You know, why is it that they've got a bit of a mental block? And listen to them, because of course, you know, us as people that talk about the importance of marketing have got to be marketers for our own business too. And that is yeah. having the ability, as Mark Ritson says, is flipping it around and seeing it from the customer's perspective yeah. because they're under an awful lot of pressure at the moment. So, and and I suppose. The best thing to do is to is to make sure that when you're talking to cu to customers, is make sure you are very structured in what you can offer, and and really offer a solution um, and a plan early on. So I was talking to a very very um, switched on guy the other day. He was talking about be clear on your playbook, you know. So in other words, and and for me that starts with diagnosis. Give me some time to get under the skin to find out what's going on with your brand and then together we work it out you know and it has to be a together thing doesn't it yeah. um so I, th I think it's evangelizing about that and then hopefully people will see that marketing is quite an important profession after all <laughs> brilliant i think that's a perfect note <laughs> yeah good i've loved this that's flown by how long have we been talking for quite a while i've been rabbiting on for ages but yes but it's all engaging interesting stuff <laughs> yeah absolutely and i think it's what's important is just to keep is to keep you know getting this message out there and giving case studies as to where it works. Another great marketing organization, of course, is KFC, McDonald's as well. They're brilliant at it because they do not stop listening to customers, you know, and that's what it's all about. That's where it has to start, right? Absolutely. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Um, sure. Before we go, is there anything that you would like to plug today? Uh, <laughs> well, that's a good question. Nothing specific, apart from the fact that I would plug, look, if someone talks to you and says, look, should we talk about brand? Should we talk about marketing? Just give them half an hour and then see what you think. I think it's definitely worth it, even if it's just a little bit of an audit, because you will find out things from your customers that you would never have expected. Yes, brilliant. Brilliant. Um, uh, I, um, I'll just brief mention, I always start with something called SOSTAC. Uh, okay. It's one of the models for putting a marketing plan together. And S, the first one starts with so situation, understand your situation, includes your customers, your um, competitors and you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It is. It's all about getting you know, exactly the, the, the three C's as, as written and others would say customers competitive company absolutely brilliant thank you so much pleasure um, um, very very nice to talk to you again and uh, let's do it again sometime absolutely and thank you everyone for watching